Pocket holes. A simple way to join wooden parts by driving screws at an angle. These are almost always made with a pocket hole jig, a clever little device that almost never comes with enough instructions to use it effectively. Well, I've got some suggestions that may help. Ow. A pocket hole joint is a butt joint held together with screws. The screws are recessed into pockets, steeply angled counterbores in the surface of one of the adjoining boards. You drive them through the pocket and into another board, joining the two boards together. You can cut the pockets in the faces of one board and then drive them into the edges or the faces of the second board to make a variety of different assemblies. As you can see, these are wonderfully versatile, easy and quick to make, but they may not always be the best joint for the job. I remember thinking that when I was first introduced to pocket holes, this is what mortise and tenons would look like if you bought them at Harbor Freight. But that's not quite fair. These are useful constructions with legitimate applications in woodworking, provided you understand their limitations. And one of the most important limitations to understand is strength. Pocket holes belong to an interesting class of woodworking joints that were invented to replace classic mortise and tenon joints with something easier and quicker to make. These include dowel joints, biscuit joints, and loose tenon joints. So how do pocket holes compare to these strength-wise? Let's do a little experiment. We're going to use a strain gauge to find the strength of a classic mortise and tenon joint. I made this myself from scratch. It was not baked from a mix. And we're going to compare that to something with no joinery whatsoever. This is just a glued butt joint. That will give us our brackets from the strongest to the weakest. Then we'll test a dowel joint, a biscuit joint, a loose tenon joint, and finally a pocket joint to see where they all fall in relationship to one another. First, the mortise and tenon. Then the butt joint the dowel joint, the biscuit joint, the domino joint, or loose tenon joint, and finally, the pocket hole joint. Well, that was a surprise. Based on this one test, we should be building everything with dowels. But I want to emphasize, this was an informal experiment. We measured everything in kilograms to make it look scientific, but for it to have any validity, we should have done each test over and over again until we had an average. Another surprise was the way in which the pocket hole failed. It was a progressive failure. The joint began failing at about 30 kilograms, not much beyond the butt joint, and the last screw let go at 48 kilograms. The average puts it in the same ballpark as biscuits and loose tenons, which pretty much follows conventional wisdom. So, if you need strength, stick to classical joinery or dowels, but pocket holes will do just fine if you have an assembly like the face frame of a cabinet, where the cabinet itself provides most of the necessary strength. And there's one more test that we should do before we break down this test apparatus. This is a pocket hole that has not been glued. Only the screws hold it together, and as you can see, not all that well. This tells us that the glue provides most of the strength in this joint. The screws are just there for alignment, mostly. And this is good to know because it means that your gluing technique is going to be extremely important for the overall durability of your pocket holes. There are several more things that you should consider as you design a pocket hole assembly. And for that, we're going to need a little terminology. There are two boards in each pocket hole joint. We're going to call the board with the pockets, the pocket board. And the board that joins to it, the joined board. A few more terms, just to avoid confusion. A typical board has three different types of surfaces ends, edges, and faces, usually two of each. And on those surfaces, it displays 
two types of grain. End grain, which is cut perpendicular to the uh, grain direction, and face grain, which is cut parallel to it, or close enough. Now, the end of the board displays end grain, oddly enough, while the edge and the face display face grain. I'm going to be careful to say edge or face when I'm talking about a surface, and face grain when I'm talking about the grain on those surfaces. The pockets are almost always drilled in the face of the pocket boards so that the screws exit the end or the edge, depending on how you want to attach the joined board. Typically, pocket holes are used to attach the end of a pocket board to the edge or the face of a joined board, an end grain to face grain joint. You can also use them to attach the edge of the pocket board to the edge or the face of the joined board, a face grain to face grain joint. By extension, you could attach the end of the pocket board to the end of the joined board, <laughs> but this is almost always a bad idea. Wood gets its strength from the continuity of the long cellulose fibers that give it grain direction. These fibers are held together by a protein called lignin, which is nowhere near as strong as the cellulose. That's why it's so much easier to split a board parallel to its grain direction than it is to break it across the grain. When you drive a screw into the end grain, the threads chop up the cellulose fibers into short segments, and all that's holding the screw in the wood is the lignin. Over-tightening the screw or putting some stress on the joint can easily strip out the hole, and the screw will come loose. Long story short, unless there's an incredibly good reason not to do so, you always want to drive the screws into the face grain of the joint board, not the end grain. And you should pay attention to the grain direction. Remember that wood expands and contracts across the grain with changes in relative humidity, but it's fairly stable along the grain. For this reason, you want the grain direction of the pocket board to match that of the joined board so the two of them expand and contract in the same direction. You don't want to screw and glue two boards together with the grain's directions opposed. The assembly will warp and twist, and the glue joints will eventually fail. However, when you're making a frame with pocket holes, you almost always have to join the boards so the grain directions are perpendicular to one another. When this is the case, the same rules that govern mortise and tenons apply. Craftsmen try to keep the tenons and mortises under 3 inches or 76 millimeters in width. By the same token, you should keep the pocket boards in the frame assembly to the same dimension. The movement over this small amount of wood won't stress the glue joint over much, but a wider board will. One last consideration. We should go over some info on screws and screw holes. Now, most of you already know this, but here's a quick review. Every screw has three major parts, the head, the shank, and the threads. For that reason, you need to drill the screw holes in three steps. First, make the counterbore or the countersink to sink the head beneath the wood surface, should you choose to do so. Make the shank hole in the same diameter as the screw shank. The shank should be able to spin easily in its hole. Then, drill a pilot hole with a slightly smaller diameter than the threads themselves. If you mic the diameter of the screw threads at their root, or minor diameter, that is, between the crests or the major diameters, that should be the diameter of your pilot hole. It gives the threads something to bite into. The shank hole is important if you want to use the screw as both a fastener and a clamp, as you do in most pocket holes. Now, we could just send the screw through both boards to hold them together, but if you want to draw them tightly against one another, you need to send the screw through the shank hole in one board and let it bite into the pilot hole in the other. A pilot hole not only directs the screw, but it keeps the wood from splitting. The screw will bite into the wood without a pilot hole, but it often acts like a wedge and it splits the wood after it's traveled far enough. A pilot hole makes this a lot less likely. You now have enough information to qualify for your degree in screwology, and it's time to begin your residency. Let's make a few pocket holes.
There are several good pocket hole jigs that sell for under $50 US, and I happen to have three of them right here. The Masca is about as basic as you can get with twin guides, a step drill bit that makes both the counterbore and the shank hole, and a stop collar. The Craig jig can be configured as a single guide or a twin guide, and there's a spacer so that you can change the space between the guides. You also get a stepped bit, a stop collar, a weird clamp pad, and a few screws. The General has fixed twin guides and is configured to drill the boards on edge, although you can also use it to drill through to the ends. You get a bit, a stop collar, screws, and some screw plugs should you want to hide the screws and the pockets. Now, I want you to know that the Workshop Companion has absolutely no agreement with any one of these manufacturers. I just read some reviews and picked three that earned some good comments. But the one comment I did not see is that none of these tools offers any way to make pilot holes. They aren't even mentioned in the instructions. Those screws that are provided are self-tapping screws, and I imagine this is supposed to be a substitute for something to make pilot holes. Self-tapping points work well enough in sheet metal, but there's no way to clear the sawdust and wood, so they still act like wedges and split the wood. You can control this in softwood somewhat by compressing the wood with a clamp as you drive the screws. But the harder the wood, the less effective this becomes. This is a pocket hole in poplar and another in cherry. I found that the wood splits about every fifth time in poplar and every time in cherry. Craig sells specific screws with different threads for softwood and hardwood, and I found that these helped somewhat in poplar, but not at all in cherry. You really need to drill pilot holes, and for that, I would suggest purchasing a 6 inch long, 1 8 inch diameter or 3 millimeter diameter aircraft drill. This will make decent pilot holes for number 8 and number 9 screws, or for those of you who are metrically inclined, 3M and 4M screws. Let's get to making a pocket hole joint. First, we need to decide where we're going to drill the pocket holes and where the shaft holes will exit the pocket board. Now normally we want those shaft holes to exit the end or the edge of the pocket board somewhere between the two faces. Where the hole exits is controlled by where you drill the pocket. As you move the pocket further back from the end or edge, the hole exits further and further down from the face. So the thicker the board, the further back you want to put the pocket. Two of the jigs that I bought, the Masca and the Craig, have adjustable stops that automatically position the pockets relative to the board's thickness. Set the stop at that thickness and the shaft hole will exit the board centered between the two faces. The General is set up for 3 quarters inch or 19 millimeter thick stock, period. The bit exits the wood 3 eighths of an inch or 9.5 millimeters from the face. You can drill pockets in thinner or thicker stock, but you have to live with that setting. Position the pocket hole jig on the pocket board and clamp it down. Now, there are many squeezy clamps that work just the same as vice grip pliers and are made especially for this task, but I don't find they work any better than a regular vanilla flavored clamp. I'm using a piece of wood as a cull with 100 grit sandpaper glued to the bottom. That's P100 for some of you. This provides some extra grip so the parts don't shift, but you have to be careful not to cover up the holes where the chips will evacuate. The depth of the pocket hole depends on the position of the stop collar, and where you put the stop collar depends on the thickness of the wood and where you want the pocket on the pocket board. Craig thoughtfully marks the bit for different thicknesses, but I found these markings slightly off. The shank hole did not exit the wood, so I had to move the stop back slightly from the mark. Neither Masca nor General have marks, but it's a simple matter to set the collar. Just insert the bit in the guide sleeve and position it so that the end of the bit is even with the stop. No matter what jig you're using, you should drill a few test holes so you know the bit is exiting the wood where you want it to exit. When everything is the way you want it, insert the drill in the sleeve until it touches the wood, then back it off a smidge. Start the drill and bore the pocket slowly, giving the chips time to escape the carnage. The next step is the pilot hole, and we can make this as we assemble the joint. 
Position the pocket board next to or atop the join board and clamp them together. I'm making an end to edge joint, so I'm clamping both boards down on my workbench. This not only holds the joint together, it aligns the faces flush with one another. When the boards are secure and properly aligned, insert the pilot hole bit in the pocket and advance it until it touches the wood. Use a piece of tape to mark the drill bit so you know when to stop the drill. On this particular joint, I want the pilot to be just one inch or 25 millimeters deep. Disassemble the joint so that we can apply glue to the adjoining surfaces. Since this is a joint that will involve end grain, we're going to use a gluing method that will help bump up the strength of the cured glue joint. Apply the glue to the end grain and wait five to 10 minutes for the end grain to absorb some of the glue. Then apply a little more glue. This ensures that whatever glue is wicked up by capillary action into the end grain won't cause the joint to be starved for glue. Put the joint back together, align the parts, and clamp them down. Then drive the screws into the pilot holes. You'll see a little glue squeeze out of the joint. Remove the clamps and wipe away the excess squeeze out with a wet rag. You can speed up this process by applying glue to the adjoining parts, clamping them together, shooting the pilot holes, and then installing the screws. That way you don't have to disassemble and then reassemble all the joints. However, if there's end grain involved, it's still a good idea to apply glue twice. On large and complex assembly, I shoot all the pilot holes and then do all the gluing. That way I don't have to wait for five minutes on each and every glue joint. And I also don't have to continually wipe glue off my pilot hole bit. You can, if you wish, make pocket hole joints without pocket hole jigs. You simply need a tilting table for your drill press and a sturdy fence. We have the plans for both, and I'll leave the link in the description, or you can click on the one that's hovering over my left shoulder. First, tilt the table to 15 degrees. I made a couple of 15 degree triangles so I can do this quickly and easily. They also help support the table during this operation. Place a scrap of wood on the table to protect it from the drill bit and position the fence so the bit will exit the workpiece in the middle of the edge or wherever you want the drill bit to exit. You may want to make a fence extension to help support long workpieces. This just clamps to the back of my fence and I can use it to reposition the workpiece for multiple pocket holes. We offer the plans for this too. Clamp the workpiece in place. If you don't have a step drill, you'll have to drill the counterbore and then the shank hole in two steps. First make the counterbore using the stop on the drill press to stop the boring about one half inch or 13 millimeters before you reach the edge or the end of the workpiece. Then switch to a smaller bit to make the shank hole and drill through to the end or edge. One last thing. Everything I read about pocket holes talked about hiding them or disguising them. And then I saw the plugs that came with the general jig and I thought, there are some possibilities here, don't you think? If you enjoyed this, hit like and subscribe. And thank you for your kind attention.